Good evening and welcome to On the Campaign Trail. Every week we focus on key issues, moments, and personalities in the long run up to election day. But we want to be clear about the lens we use. We know that the democratic project is in great danger and that shapes how we see the 2022 vote. It isn't just elections as usual. On the Campaign Trail seeks to make sense of the 2022 elections in that context of democratic decay. We want to discern patterns in the election landscape, to understand paths to victory, to discuss relevant policies, to seek useful perspectives, while keenly aware that the anti-democratic clock is ticking. In 2022, Hashtag we decide without neglecting the other basic questions on the campaign trail will ask how we decide and why we decide. Good evening. I'm John Neri. Our first guest is the one national candidate who cannot physically hit the campaign trail or even Join us online, Senator Laila de Lima. She has been detained in Camp Crame on bogus charges since February 2017, more than four years and nine months ago. She communicates with the outside world, mainly through her Senate staff. In the last few days, I have been conducting an interview with Senator de Lima. I sent her questions on Sunday, received her answers on Monday, sent her follow-up questions on the same day and received her second round of answers on Tuesday. I sent one last follow-up question and received her last answer today. Call it an interview on an installment plan. So this is what we'll do. I will ask my questions and we will show you Senator Delima's answers in her own handwriting. We've invited attorney Dino De Leon as the senator's representative. He'll read Senator Delima's answers and will answer a couple of questions himself. We have to go through this non-normal route because of the unreasonable restrictions placed on her. When we talk about democratic decay, just take a look, among many other outrages, at the administration campaign against Senator Dinim. Let me start by asking the first, the basic question. Why are you running for re-election, Senator Dinim? Half of the Senate work is substantially on the floor and in committee hearings. I only had the chance of experiencing that for eight months before Duterte basically deprived me of my term as Senator of the Republic. Basically, I was robbed of my legitimate term as Senator. Aside from pursuing with more vigor my, my foremost advocacies, namely social justice, human rights, criminal justice reform, good governance and rule of law and national sovereignty, my running for the election is mainly to make Duterte and all his minions accountable for their crimes and give justice to the thousands they murdered in the drug war. You won 40 million votes in 2016, but in the three Pulse Asia surveys of 2021, your numbers are quite low. I understand this as the direct result of five years of sustained attacks led by President Duterte himself, on your person, your character. Do you agree that the administration's systematic demonization of you has brought your numbers down? How do you plan to fight this demonization in the six months to election day? To the first question, an absolute yes. Going into my Senate term, I was averaging around 60% trust rating. After the congressional hearings, both House and Senate, that targeted me 
and Duterte's almost daily media attacks in 2016 and early 2017, this went down to somewhere just above 10%. I still enjoy 99% awareness insofar as awareness is concerned. I am still way up there together with Senator Manny Pacquiao and Rafi Tulpo. It is just that now I am known as a villain, a devil woman. So the main target of my campaign is to convert that awareness into votes, i.e. convince the 80% of voters that everything that Duterte said about me are all lies, which they are. This is a difficult task considering that I, I am in jail and the government still makes sure that the, peop that the people do not even see a glimpse of and hear from me. I continue to enjoy, so to speak, a solid support from 5 million Filipinos who, no matter what Duterte threw at me, still believe in me and what I fight for. If only each of those 5 million are able to convince another 5 voters to vote for me, I have a chance. Lima para kay Delima. Uh, Attorney Dino, I'd like to ask you a direct question. I wasn't able to ask this question of Senator De Lima. Uh, when she spoke of a solid support base of 5 million, um, I wonder what she meant. Do you, you have a breakdown of that? Uh, where, where are these 5 million uh, supporters? Well, John, um, when the campaign team actually crunched the numbers based on the surveys conducted from 2018, 2019, 2020, and the recent surveys, um, Senator Red Lima usually gets around 10 to 12 percent support base. So um, that's an estimated of around 5 million uh, voters if our total voting population is around um, 50 million. So that's the estimate of around 5 million um, um, loyal voters. So it's always 10 to 12 percent. Um, in the recent surveys, even though in the past she her trust rating was 60 percent, it's now um, just around 10 to 12 percent. So that's where we um, got the analysis or the conclusion that right now, whatever happens, despite the fact that the senator suffered um, character assassination from this government, she still um, gets a loyal uh, base of around 5 uh, million voters. Thank you. I will get back to my questions for Senator De Lima. I asked her, was your arrest on February 24, 2017, on what are clearly trumped up charges, inevitable? I don't mean to suggest that there was anything you could have done even as a newly elected senator to stop Duterte. But at what point did you think you were in fact going to be arrested? You are correct. The only way for me to avoid demolition and arrest was to submit to Duterte and not hold Senate hearings on the EJ case. This was what was telegraphed to me then by Malacanang through mutual contacts. Even some senators themselves told me so. Just stop attacking Duterte and he will let you be, they said. In fact, Duterte did what he did to silence me and to deprive me of the Senate as a platform from which I can hold him accountable for the murders being committed every day by his regime. I already know I was going to be arrested eventually when the DOJ railroaded the preliminary investigation of my drug cases. At the time, I was abroad to receive an award in Washington, D.C. and for a speaking engagement in Germany. Still, I came back to face my arrest and Duterte's fake charges against me. I continued to speak against Duterte because his objective was to silence me. I was not going to let him accomplish that. For me to stop means that I would have compromise in, in exchange for my freedom. There can be no compromise on my principles and what I fight for, especially with someone like Duterte who has no, who has no scruples whatsoever. I want to relate the context you just drew to the coming campaign. Part of the systematic villainization uh, of yourself is painting you as galit, maingay, reclamador, walang ambag. The idea is to turn principle into mere politicking. But now there is also 
your standard bearer, Vice President Lenny Robredo, calling for a different approach, mas radical ang magmahal. How should we understand laban politics in relation to radical political love? Uh, Attorney Dina, hold on. I think we just lost your audio. Uh... Okay. There go. Please start again. Okay. Thank you. P.P. Lenny's call for radical love is not at all anathema to what we have been fighting for all along, human rights and social justice for the poorest and most marginalized. Why did we choose those causes? Basically, it's because of the love for the people. Definitely, it does not mean we do away with justice and accountability, but because we have been remiss in the past in connecting with the people and in recognizing their foremost grievances, we must adopt a new attitude of listening to and understanding them. This will hopefully also help us understand why after the recovery years of the Pinoy admin, people still chose someone like Duterte to lead them to more progress and prosperity. Of course, that did not happen. But we should not stop looking for that right brand of leadership that our people yearn for so we do not squander again years of progress to senseless populism. Um, sorry, Senator, but this new attitude that you speak of, is it really possible for someone who has spent almost five years in jail to adopt? I, I guess what I really want to ask is how has your radical lack of freedom changed you? Uh, can you really say it has helped you understand people's foremost grievances? I don't think it is impossible for anyone to adapt to new attitudes, new approaches, and ultimately new and more responsive solutions. My understanding and philosophy have always been that one of the key skills bundled up in what we call leadership is the ability to listen and adapt. Ruling without listening and adapting to the needs of the people you are serving is not leadership, but tyranny. So in truth, it is not against my nature to listen, adapt, and respond. I think it is one of the key skills I nurtured as CHR chairperson, which may not possess a lot of coercive power, but has its advantage in its capacity and capability, the capability to listen to all sides, i.e. those of duty and rights holders. Now, as someone who has seen things from the, uh, another side of the battle, i.e., from the perspective of a victim of human rights abuses, not just as a defender, I'm no longer just operating from a place of sympathy, but of deeply real empathy. I am no longer just listening from the outside. I can feel and know their suffering and understand where victims and other defenders under threat need the most assistance and support. It is easier to urge people to fight for their rights, but it is much harder to actually be that person who is under attack and still fighting to find the courage to continue fighting. So yes, it, it, it really is possible and in fact inevitable that someone like me who has spent almost five years under unjust detention to adapt, evolve, and become a stronger defender for others. When your colleague in the Senate and now in the Senate slate, Senator Trianes, was in detention in his first run for the Senate in 2007, I think, he was allowed to do a limited amount of campaigning for about a month before he was shut down again. What can you tell us about your plans to convince the COMELEC to allow you to campaign in 2022? How will you campaign from your cell? Comelec is not my problem. It is the courts of Muntinlupa who will decide as to the extent of how I can campaign. Granting me for low to campaign is definitely out of the question. They will not even let me participate in Senate sessions and hearings via teleconferencing. But since they allowed me to file my candidacy, I am hopeful that they will allow me to produce campaign videos from jail. 
that is the most I can expect. My campaign team will just have to be ultra creative and resourceful to compensate for the handicaps inherent in my situation. Surely, it will be quite a daunting endeavor, but with a determined team, which we have, nothing is impossible. How about if I can just run an idea by you? The possibility of participating in a public forum covered by media and then shown live on TV and social media. In the 1978 uh, interim Batasang Pamatsa elections, Nina Aquino, despite having been sentenced to death, was allowed to join the TV program Face the Nation. Is this something you would like to pursue? That is a possibility, but that again depends on the courts and how Duterte's influence still affects their decision making. You must always remember that Duterte jailed me precisely to silence me. He won't allow me just yet to speak and campaign before an audience. It will be an extraordinarily brave judge who will go against Duterte and allow me to fully campaign, even if from, from prison only. Attorney Dina, if I can ask you directly, uh, what is uh, the Senate office or the campaign organization of Senator Benima doing right now to ensure that she will enjoy more campaigning rights? Um, of course, John, that is quite a difficult question. Um, uh, I'm also one of the lawyers of Senator de Lima. So legally, we intend to file um, a motion so that the um, court will allow her to at least shoot videos or to campaign from prison. Um, of course, she will not be allowed to physically come out of um, incarceration. But hopefully, the, the judge will allow her some leeway for her to be able to produce campaign videos. No? That's legally speaking. Now, for the campaign trail, we have no option but to rely on possible surrogates, representatives, and hopefully the people will see that, in fact, um, someone like Senator Daya de Lima is fighting for them, which is why she cannot physically attend all the campaign sorties. In other words, uh, we will be relying on the people's volunteerism um, to um, realize that, indeed, Senator Laila de Lima deserves her, uh, their vote, especially considering the fact that she is the only senator who had to face jail time just so that she will be consistent with her principles and her mandate to protect and defend human rights in every Filipino. Thank you. Again, I think the experience of Senator Trillanes uh, in 2007 is instructive. Uh, uh, he was able to win, uh, even just for a month, uh, the right to uh, host interviews right in uh, the detention center. And uh, he also told me that he was even able to take part in one uh, televised debate. So maybe that's something that you can consider. But okay. let me move on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, speaking of Senate slates, uh, Senator De Lima, you have already welcomed your one-time tormentor, Senator Gordon, into VP Lenny's Senate slate. Some might see this as a concession to pragmatic politics. How did you come to this decision? And if we can broaden our perspective, how did you, uh, what does this decision say about your philosophy of politics? I already made myself clear on why I do not object to being on the same slate as Senator Gordon. I will just repeat what I said in my dispatch on that. Senator, Senator Gordon has, in so many ways, already expressed regret for what he did in the past when he called out Duterte for imprisoning a senator elected by the people. That's quote and quote. And since I do not have any fundamental or irreconcilable differences in politics with Senator Gordon, the only thing that would prevent me from working with him is when I have not forgiven him yet. But I already did, even if he did not directly ask me for forgiveness. He does not have to. There is no sacrifice of my principles here in the name of political pragmatism. Some, in fact, view it as a gesture of magnanimity. I wish we had more time, but let me ask one more question. What do you say to arguments like those offered in defense of Isco Moreno and his lukewarm response to your plight that your prolonged detention is no longer a matter for the president because it is now with the courts? I would like, in fact, to ask each presidential candidate what their stand is regarding your case. It really should be one of the defining issues of the 2022 elections. 
Senator, how would you like each candidate to respond? I would like them to recognize what former senior associate Justice Carpio has pointedly described as the, quote, grosses injustice ever perpetrated in recent memory, end quote. The plain truth is that the charges filed against me are all politically motivated and that the DOJ as Duterte's executioner under Aguirre and now Guevara are just acting on his orders. That means that if Duterte is no longer president, it's a moral imperative as it is an issue of elemental justice for the new president to order his DOJ to withdraw the charges that Duterte's DOJ fabricated against me. Otherwise, he or she will also be a party to the fabrication and injustice. As I hold everyone in the DOJ who has participated in my prosecution a party to this most dishonorable and corrupt enterprise of knowingly persecuting an innocent person. Even Guevara, with his intelligence, cannot, cannot deny the fact that he is using and continues to use disqualified criminal convicts as, a, as state witnesses, perjured witnesses of that against me. I don't expect his DOJ to be suddenly decent and forthright towards me. But the least that I expect from the DOJ of anyone who succeeds Duterte is to recognize the fact that Duterte's DOJ knowingly and willfully fabricated the evidence against me and that, as such, these cases should forthwith be withdrawn. Thank you, Senator Dilima, and thank you, Attorney De Leon. Again, we have had to take this non-normal route because Senator De Lima remains in detention. But this only reflects the situation into which she had been thrown. That, in my view, is not normal. We should not normalize abuse of power or the weaponization of the rule of law. We are now joined by two leading election experts, both lawyers. Attorney Louis Tito Guia served as a commissioner in the Commission on Elections from 2013 to 2020. Attorney Ona Caritos is Executive Director of LENTE, the Legal Network for Truthful Elections. Thank you for joining us tonight. Our pleasure. Our pleasure and our honor. Yeah, congratulations I, for the inaugural uh, podcast. Thank you, Commissioner. I have the same first and, in fact, basic question for both of you. Can we, in fact, expect truthful elections in 2022? Do you want to answer first, uh, John? Sir? Uh, Attorney Ona, please go ahead. Uh, truthful elections will be a challenge in next year's election, especially with uh, how things are going and how misinformation and disinformation has been used in previous elections as a strategy of some candidates and some of their supporters to, uh, to be beneficial to the candidates. So it will be a challenge. Uh, truthful elections will be a challenge, but hopefully with uh, groups coming together, uh, individuals coming together, uh, misinformation, disinformation will be highlighted in the elections and it will be somehow tempered. Its role in the elections will be tempered. Thank you. Commissioner? Yeah, well, uh, I, I echo what Ona said. Uh, it, it's really uh, a challenging election in terms of uh, truthfulness, but uh, I would want to use the term genuine democratic election because that is what is used uh, internationally to uh, as, a, as a standard for measuring uh, the success or of, of the election, meaning it should be fair and it, it should be free. It's free when everyone is, uh, um, you know, they can campaign and they can say what they want. It's fair, of course, if everyone has equal opportunity to, you know, contest election and maybe the voters would have equal opportunity to get truthful information. So uh, in that sense, I think it's a big challenge and there's there are a lot of things that must be done. Public must be vigilant. Thank you. I, I, I know that uh, both of you have already worked on this particular issue that I will bring up, but I would like to draw to the attention of the audience uh, the fact that, one, there is a vacancy in the commission. Uh, there are only five commissioners and, of course, the chairman. 
And then the, the chairman and two commissioners will be retiring on February 2, uh, 2022, just uh, three months before the elections. Uh, so it's possible that we are looking at three plus one vacancies. Uh, surely this must be an additional challenge to having a genuine democratic election in 2022. Um, it would be because uh, first and foremost, you plan you plan for election uh, is starting, I think, uh, as early as after you shall have closed the previous election. So that would mean two, two and a half years of uh, uh, planning and preparation. Actually, one year before election, it's all execution. So you had the chairman uh, uh, leading the plan and the execution and two other commissioners, and usually these are senior commissioners who would, of course, uh, uh, who played uh, critical roles in preparing for the elections and planning and preparing for the elections. They will retire four months or three months before election, and there will be new ones who would, including the chair, who would, you know, steer the the, the, the commission uh, uh, on, on, on actual election day. So that, that itself would uh, pose some challenges. But, uh, you know, we're relying on the fact that, you know, the two other commissioners or the three other commissioners have been there for quite some time, especially, um, you know, um, uh, Commissioner Quesquejo and Commissioner Ferolino, who had been uh, career... Uh, uh, so we hope that they can, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, perform their role well. Uh, thank you. I, I, I do have a follow-up question for you, uh, Com, but I'd like to hear Attorney Ona first uh, on the question of the vacancies. And, the and just to, yeah, thank you, John. Just to add to what uh, Sir Louis said earlier, another challenge is how close the appointments will be to the election. So, I hope that the president appoints the missing commissioner even before the retirement of the other uh, of the two commissioners and the chairperson, so that this uh, missing commissioner will have two more months, two uh, three more months to prepare and to study uh, what what's needed to be done for the elections next year. So that's another challenge: the clear, the uh, uh, closeness of the appointments to the actual conduct of the elections. Thank you. Uh, Com Louis, my follow-up question to you, what exactly do the commissioners do? I mean, the, the Comelec has this infrastructure, right? There are uh, career employees, uh, and I've heard you speak in forums talking about the integrity of many of these same uh, uh, government employees. So there is, there is, there is a, there's an army of people ready to, to do the election work. What exactly do the con uh, the commissioners bring to the table well the commissioners the, the the chairperson and the six commissioners is the commission on election but you have about 5000 staff all mm -hmm. over the country uh mm -hmm. is the only uh institution that uh, must have at least two personnel in each of the municipalities all over the country so uh, it, so it, it's uh it's a, it's a big organization but it is the commission itself, meaning the chairman, chairperson, and the commission and bank, or the, the, the commissioners that decide on questions of policy. Of course, they can overturn decisions uh, that has already been made before. They can, you know, uh, and, 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 and make uh, this. They decide cases, of course, uh, um, disqualifications, cancellation of certificates of candidacy. They have jurisdictions to uh, resolve election, post-election protest. Uh, and it's a powerful uh, uh, body in ter um, during election time. Uh, and uh, the commission uh, can deputize the entire bureaucracy with the concurrence of the president, including the, uh, uh, the, 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 the military, the armed forces mm -hmm. of the Philippines to, uh, you know, um, to um, um, perform election work, so it's a very powerful institution, and 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 it's it's a very powerful commission. Of course, you have the bureaucracy, but the bureaucracy would you know would take their cue from the uh, um, and uh, from the commissioners. But what is special about this coming election is the pandemic and a lot of other uh, important. Uh, should I say, um, maybe unprecedented uh, circumstances like uh, the proliferation of uh, 
disinformation. And I think uh, there might be some contingencies or um, unforeseen uh, circumstances that need decisions. And these decisions would have to be made by the commissioners, not by the career people. So that's how important it is, especially in the coming election. Uh, one more question, uh, Com. Um, I, I checked in, twen and in 2019, uh, the commission was full. I mean, there were, there's a chairman and six uh, commissioners, and you were still on that uh, commission. Has there ever been a uh, national election where we had uh, vacancies in the commission? Well, none that I can remember. Um, even in 2004, I think that was an occasion similar to what we are having now, where the chairperson then retired February of 2004, coming into the uh, 2004 election. Um, and uh, no, uh, I, I think there are two commissioners uh, who uh, came in, not the chairperson. So um i came in into the commission barely three weeks before election so um uh na com completo naman. we were complete at the time that the election was run um so um we, we were complete in 2019 yes yes uh attorney ona mm -hmm. there is a perception that the president is packing the commission with uh, Davao supporters. Uh, I have nothing against Atene de Davao. It's one of the uh, country's best universities. But there are three lawyers from Atene, Atene de Davao's uh, College of Law who are serving uh, as commissioners. Um, now there's a vacancy, and then there are three retirements. Um, from your work, monitoring uh, what's happening uh, in the Comelec, do you see uh possibility of more Davao uh, appointees being appointed, uh, being named to the commission? Well, unfortunately, Sir John, if we take a look at the previous appointments made by President Duterte to the Commission on Elections, then that trend will continue. So there's really that call or by made by a uh, former Kamala chairperson, Christian S. Monson, for uh, public vetting of the appointees to be done by uh, President Duterte to Comelec. So uh, we're hoping that other appointees will be made and not just coming from one uh, location in the Philippines because there are other good people outside of Davao. So we're hoping for other appointments. But at the end of the day, it's still the prerogative of the president. He's still the appointing authority. He'll be the, he will be the one to decide on the appointments to be made to the Commission on Elections. But uh, we joined the call of uh, Comelec Chairperson Christian S. Monson when it comes to public vetting or for more uh, public involvement or participation in the appointments to be done by the President uh, in the Comelec. Thank you. There's another issue that's actually uh, hugging the headlines uh, these days related to the credibility of the elections, and that has to do with the, uh, the winning of the bid for the logistics uh, side uh, by F2 Logistics, which is owned by uh, a, a, a businessman who is very close to the president, uh, Dennis Rui. Um, maybe we can separate uh, the issues here. Uh, first issue, would there be an impact on the results of the elections because this particular uh, company was uh, chosen to handle the logistics side of it? No. Um, so yeah, Jan, uh, go ahead, Com. Yeah, Jan, I can understand the, uh, the concern that people may have because of the circumstances, but... Uh, you see, uh, if if the preparations were done according to how it should be done, then there should have there should be no concern uh, about the result of the election because, uh, well, we need to examine what uh, uh, F two logistic was contracted to do. What they are contracted to do, of course, would be to just transport uh, the uh, election paraphernalia from the central uh, warehouse. To uh, the uh, to the uh, to the hubs and to where they should be going, 
So uh, before the transportation, of course, you have this procedure of sealing and making sure that they are not tampered while they're uh, being transported. Of course, uh, and, and, and when they arrive at their destination, you check whether they have been tampered. And these are procedures that need to be done. So um and and but but I understand that there will be concern because of the you know the, the personalities involved. And therefore I think it is important with due respect to my former colleagues in Comelec for them to take extra step in assuring people that uh, nothing uh that 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 they will allow utmost transparency in the logistics uh, process that they would allow for instance watchers that they would allow uh independent trackers of where the uh, uh um the uh des where the um perhaps the um the uh the vehicles or the the tracks or or or, or how the um par paraphernalia par are transported and all these things everything that needs to be transparent about comelec must be uh must exercise extra effort to to assure the public by by you know Kung pwede nga, uh, you 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 bring your you know you allow parties to post you know watchers and could even accompany the transportation of uh, mm -hmm. uh, these uh, perpernelias. Uh, um, so so it's a challenge really. It's it's something uh, Comelec need to understand the concern of the people here, and it's important uh, for the credibility of the process. You know, sometimes we are content when we were in Comelec, we are content with you know, with assuring ourselves that everything will be safe, everything will be okay. But if we fail to assure people that indeed things will be okay, then we also we would have also failed in, in what we are supposed to do. So transparency is one way of, uh, 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 one way that com is a very important uh, um, thing that Comelec should uh, assure the people or to give to the people and, and the stakeholders so that, you know, uh, all these issues of, 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 of all these concerns can be uh, uh, addressed. Thank you, Com Louis, for actually addressing uh, both issues. Uh, I wanted to separate them. So you, you talked about the right. technical part, uh, and then you also talked about the credibility part. Uh, and of course, the community has a role there. So maybe I can just rephrase my question uh, for attorney uh, Ona. Um, Comunic uh, spokesperson uh, James Jimenez gave a very detailed uh, explanation of exactly what will be done to ensure mm -hmm. that uh, there will be no tampering of the results and so on and so forth and, and that F2 Logistics is in no position to tamper with the results. So he talked about sealing, he talked about the printing of the zero report, he talked about uh, the uh, essentially non-use of the voting count, vote counting machines after the election result is mm -hmm. printed and so on. So my, my question to you, Attorney Ona, is given that, uh, so that's the flow chart, so to speak, uh, or, or, or the workflow or whatever, where are the vulnerabilities that we should, uh, that people should, uh, I guess, mobilize around to make sure that, uh, Tampering does not happen, that the results are not uh, uh, trifled with. Uh, to, to answer your question, Sir John, uh, fraud can happen in all the stages during the transport. So people should look at, uh, at the time, the all the equipment paraphernalia, uh, the, uh, the VCMs are stored in the central storage. And then it's, it's from being transported to the regional house and then to the uh, treasurer's office into the different uh, locations where the gadgets, or where the uh, equipment, where the ballots, where the equipment paraphernalia, where the election paraphernalia will be transported. So in all stages, uh, fraud can happen. Uh, there are vulnerabilities. So just like what Commissioner Louis said earlier, uh, the comment needs to be transparent about this transportation process, how, uh, how all the equipment, how the ballots, Will be transported from the central storage up down to the uh, polling day, uh, polling day or polling place location. So there are vulnerabilities at all the stages. So people need to get involved. They need to be aware that uh, they can monitor 
are they can observe the transportation, they can observe the storage. So those are the two main things that people should look at: the storage and the transportation of all this equipment of all this election paraphernalia. Thank you. Uh, we're running late, so let me just uh, ask my last question. Uh, Commissioner Louis uh, uh, actually already adverted to this. No, the impact of the pandemic. Uh, that's another challenge, right? Uh, first of all, how do you, I'll ask the two of you, how do you visualize the pandemic actually affecting the way people will vote and the way the vote will be counted? Well, uh, well, of course, uh, you would have to have physical distancing. You have you would have to undergo all this protocol. You will see alcohols perhaps everywhere. There's a requirement for um, uh, face masks so what's going to happen is that you know there will be queues and uh, elections might uh, run up to the late evenings uh, hopefully it will not reach the next day so that is the voting uh, that that is the impact of the pandemic uh, come election and there we we hear some people who would uh, say that they are fearful of uh, uh, going to the polling places because of a uh, fear of getting infected. So there must be a lot of uh, effort on the part of the Comelec and, and, and everyone else uh, on, on making people feel confident that they will save when they exercise their right. But apart, uh, John, from uh, maybe on voting day and uh, during the counting, it is also important to look at the impact of the pandemic during the campaign because, you know, you, can, you can't have elections. Uh, you can't have people just voting. They should... They should be informed. They should uh, know the issues. So these are usually uh, this is usually uh, um, 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 realized during campaigns. Now, uh, and that is, I will just connect this with the uh, you know with the issue of having you know the requirement of having independent uh, chairperson and, and commissioners uh, 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 exercising their independence during uh, uh, during the electoral process. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, there is this uh, requirement, I think, that uh, certain local governments or, or lo local governments may have a may have the power or authority to decide which might uh, lock down and which uh, areas may not. No? So uh, I, I fear that this would this might be uh, uh, um, used by certain politicians for for political advantage. Uh, particularly at the local level. So it's important, I think, for COMELEC to be having its own assessment of uh, the situation free from influence and free from, you know, even uh, maybe you they can also check what IATF might uh, uh, might, might recommend. Uh, uh, and, and, and you need a very strong COMELEC for that. So uh, the right to information of, of voters is important and that might be compromised uh, during the campaign the guys of uh, you know uh, complying with the rules on uh, protocols uh, brought about by the pandemic so it's campaign and voting thank you may i uh, hear from you attorney ona in the two stages that uh, commissioner Louis mentioned during the campaign and on election day conduct or during voting it's important it's imperative on the part of the commission on elections to have a clear information dissemination plan because if people and all electoral stakeholders like political parties, candidates, and the supporters will not be informed right away or in advance of these new guidelines protocols on uh, the campaign and on election day conduct, uh, it will be hard and it will not be that safe for our electoral stakeholders to go out and vote. So our call always has our call has always been in length uh, for common electorities as early as possible, these guidelines, this new regulation these new regulations or health protocols uh, that will address the pandemic during uh, these elections. Because if they will release these guidelines early or in advance, so a lot of organizations like civil society organizations and political parties as well can help out COMELEC to inform the people right away on what to expect, on what are the new things to expect, especially on election day. Thank you. I'll give the last word to Attorney Ona. Uh, what is Lente doing, uh, maybe in partnership with other groups, uh, as far as two issues are concerned? One, the disinformation that you spoke of, uh, and two, the uh, search for new Comelec commissioners. 
uh, to address misinformation and disinformation. Thank you, uh, uh, Sir John, for giving me this opportunity to talk about our work. To address misinformation and disinformation in the elections, we're uh, doing two modalities or we're doing two activities. One is working with major PR organizations and individuals engaged in political propaganda in the Philippines in coming out with uh, professional standards for PR firms and individuals engaged in political propaganda. So it's a norm-inducing document to highlight the role of PR firms uh, in the fight against misinformation and disinformation. And we're hoping that more and more PR organizations and individuals engaged in polit political propaganda sign this document and show their support uh, to this document. And we're also hoping that Comelec will uh, support this document as well because uh, misinformation, disinformation is a big problem and this doc document will not uh, solve it, but it will be a good start. It will be a good step to highlight the problem. On on the appointments of COMELEC commissioners and chairperson this coming February, uh, we've always talked about uh, reviving this COMELEC appointment, appointments watch, which we saw happen uh, more than a decade ago in the 2010 national and local elections. So there was a COMELEC appointments watch uh, uh, organized by civil society organizations composed of election and non-election non organizations which vetted personalities or which vetted individuals who can be part of the shortlist to be submitted to Malacanang for the president to, con to consider as uh, his appointees in the COMELEC. So, we hope to revive that appointments watch again in time for the February appointments to be done by the president. Thank you, Attorney Ona, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Louis. Uh, as you both pointed out, uh, a very challenging election in the context of democratic decay. Uh, there's so much to talk about. We will definitely have you back on our show. Uh, but thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's a privilege and honor. Thank you. That's it for us tonight. Follow us on the campaign trail because it isn't just elections as usual. Next week, we will sit down with two presidents, the president of Pulse Asia, Ronnie Holmes, and the president of the Senate, Tito Soto. This is John Neri. Good night.